Woohoo! What is up, everyone? And welcome to Modern Day Debate. We are a neutral, nonpartisan platform welcoming everybody from all walks of life. If you're looking for even more fantastic debates, we are all over the internet, including your favorite podcasting platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, and of course YouTube. So if you enjoy debates, please don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe, including tonight's debate on Did Noah's Ark Exist and Work? With our debaters, Dr. Chris and Kyle Adams, here to help us Find out, and if you enjoy what either of them have to say tonight, our guest links are in the description below. You can also tag me in chat at Amy Newman with your question or comment for our Q&A section. Those super chats will get you set to the top of the list. With that, I am going to hand it over to the affirmative for their opening statement. The floor is all yours. And got to unmute, but that was my fault because I mute everybody at the beginning. Oh, okay. Now I'm unmuted. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Welcome all to Scripture Study. Today we're talking about the feasibility of Noah's Ark, and I'm really excited well, to be I... here. So in order to really determine just how feasible that Ark was, we need to first gather the, the context of it, uh, the specifications and things like that. And so I think the best way to do that is to go to the source and kind of establish where those goalposts are. So I'm just reading here from Genesis chapter six in the, the King James Bible. And, uh, and I'll just get started from there. It says, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they chose, or sorry, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives, all of which they chose. Okay, so first question here is, when did men begin to multiply upon the face of the earth? I look at that, and that, I think that's the time of Adam and Eve, right? That's those were the that was the first man, the first woman, and they began to multiply, and so that's right there is kind of when this got, when things got started here. Okay, uh, so from the time of Adam and Eve until Noah at this time, and it says, and the spirit of the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. So as I understand it, and there's multiple interpretations on this, but one of the interpretations that really gets to me on this is saying, hey, because th those guys are being wicked, I'm going to give them 120 years. And then after that, time's up. And so you guys got to repent. Uh, you've got a time limit. And this kind of happens from time to time throughout the Bible. I just kind of think about the city of Nineveh with Jonah and the whale there and how he kind of gave them a time limit to repent. And if they didn't repent in time, then yeah, that's kind of time for destruction. And uh, so this is kind of one of those uh, things. And then it says, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Okay, so what days are we talking about? There were giants in the earth in those days. Well, we already just established that whole context of those days being from the time of Adam and Eve until Noah, when men began to multiply upon the face of the earth. So, uh, there were giants in those days for a long time. And uh, it's saying here that they were mighty men, which were men of old. Okay, they lived for a long time, and they were men of renown. We understand Adam uh, lived for a long time. Uh, 
And we also understand that Noah, he lived for a really long time. I think the Bible uh, later describes him as uh, living as long as 950 years. Okay, that's how old he lived, according to uh, the Bible. Okay, and he was mighty enough to build an ark. And uh, yeah, and of all of the scripture stories in in the Bible, I think one of the most memorable scripture studies is Noah, Noah and the flood. So yeah, Noah was definitely a man of great renown. So uh, right here, this appears to me like it's describing Noah here, that Noah very well could have been a giant, okay? And so later on, as we read in the scriptures here, uh, it's going on and it tells us the kind of the specifications of the ark, okay? They were measured in cubits, right? And the length of a cubit is from the tip of your elbow to the tip of your fingers. And so that is going to be different on every person. And yeah, if so, according to me, a cubit is one length, but if someone has an arm that is like twice the length, you're going to have twice the size of an arc. And so the question really is like, how big would a man have to be in order to fit all the different animals on the arc? Right. And so, and yeah. And so the, but that question right there is another a whole another whole ball game because when we start thinking about all the animals that were on the ark, how many animals were there on the earth in those days? Uh, and what's gopher wood? Like, what did they make the ark out of? Did they call gopher wood? Or was that referring? What's a gopher tree? And apparently, there is a gopher tree in Florida somewhere. Uh, it's kind of similar to a cypress tree, uh, but was that the same tree today as they were referring to back then? I don't know. And so it's really easy to look at these things and with a kind of a, a presentism, a presentism where we're kind of looking at things, taking a modern standard and judging things of old with that same standard. So how many different animals were on the earth in those days? Uh, I can just look at uh, how many dogs are on the earth today. Okay. Right today there, there it's said that uh, according to some standards, there are over 360 different breeds of dog. Okay. Do you think all 360 different breeds of dog were around 200 years ago? I don't think so. Okay. We have a lot more animals on the earth today than we did 200 years ago, right? And so uh, it, the question is, can we really account for all of the different kinds of animals that were on uh, the earth even a thousand years ago? I don't know. And so there's this huge question of like, were there far fewer animals in Noah's day than there are today? And so if Noah's a lot, larger man than many people would have expected. And uh, if there's far fewer animals on in the world back in, in his day than there are today, then I see this as completely feasible. There's, I don't have any problems with them building an ark uh, and being able to put all the animals on it. So uh, I think that kind of sums up kind of the, the primary points here that I've got. Uh, I'll pass it on to you. Let's hear what you have to say. Thank you for your opening statement from Kyle Adams. And with that, we are going to hand it over to the negative. Dr. Chris, the floor is all yours. Great. Thank you for having me. I, oh, actually, Amy, I think you need to enable sharing for me because I do have a presentation. Can you do that, please? Thank you for having me anyway. Let me get started a little bit on my introduction. So my name is Chris Thompson. I am an assistant professor of neuroscience at Virginia Tech. Um, now, you might be wondering why a professor of neuroscience is doing something like this. Well, let's see. My background um, as an undergraduate was in evolutionary biology at the University of Illinois. So I have an interest in evolution. And of course, 
in the United States, that means that it inevitably bumps up against creationism. So I have a strong interest in this. Now, most that, you know, because I have a bachelor's in evolutionary biology actually doesn't even make me an expert in evolution. Um, I know a lot about it. I know more about it than like most neuroscientists, for instance. But um, most experts in evolutionary biology don't see the utility in this at all of debating creationists or people who believe that Noah's Ark is real. They think it's kind of silly. I think it's just kind of fun. So that's why I'm doing this. Um, so do we have sharing up yet? Yes, we do. Excellent. Thank you for doing that. So one second. Hold on. Let me get my presentation up. One second. Sorry about this. That's okay. Everyone out there in chat and on the interwebs, hello, hello. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe. Okay. So, are we up and ready to go? Yes, Good deal. All right. So, what my work is about is I study how hormones shape the development and plasticity of neural circuits. And I study this in a wide range of species. And I can do this because... Well, it turns out that the, all species have a uh, common ancestor, including different animals, with humans. So we can study an awful lot about human health and conditions uh, from animal models. Now, the views that I express tonight are my own and do not reflect the views of Virginia Tech or the great Commonwealth of Virginia. Let's talk about Noah's Ark. All right. So tonight's debate is about whether the story of Noah's Ark is feasible and did it actually exist? Here's a picture, artist's rendition of Noah's Ark. So let's get into it. The thing about feasibility is like, okay, is Noah's Ark even possible, right? I suppose that's one aspect of what we're talking about. Now, I kind of find this to be a silly question. It's a little bit like asking if the Death Star from, you know, Star Wars could actually destroy Alderaan. Like, I suppose you could imagine the ability to build some sort of giant space a uh, spaceship that's like the size of a moon that has a big laser and destroys all around. Now, that didn't happen. It's fantasy. And the thing is, of course, Noah's Ark is fantasy too. But the thing is, I, like, I don't even think Noah's Ark is even feasible. So let's get into this a little bit. Now, like as a neuroscientist, do I know anything about nautical engineering? No, obviously not. But I don't think you have to be a nautical engineer to know how absurd the story of Noah's Ark is. All right. So Kyle said that like, we don't know how long qubits are. I know that there's some debate about qubits. Never heard anyone argue that Noah was a giant, but okay. Um, it seems a little weird since he, he's actually the father of all humanity. Um, you would think that many of us would be giants too, since everyone is descended from Noah, right? Anyway, so, so many scholars settle on qubits being a certain length and that Noah's Ark would have been around 510 feet long. Okay, that's what many scholars believe. That's more than one and two thirds football fields long. I'm talking about American football. You know what I'm talking about? So that that's a big, big, big ship. It was three layers, right? So there are three decks within. And this was supposed to hold all the animals. Maybe let's get to that. We'll, we'll talk about that. All right. So what about real wooden boats? That's fantasy. We're going to get into real wooden boats. So the largest boat ever made was actually made only around 100 years ago, which makes sense, right? Like it would, you would imagine technology only getting better and better over time. These were the six masted schooners. These were specialized here in the United States. They were built to be massive so that they could carry American coal over to Europe. So they had to be big so that you can carry enough coal over one trip to make it economically feasible. These ships were huge, okay? The Wyoming was the biggest of them all. But so this was built in 1909. It was a huge, unwieldy ship, and it was only 350 feet long, which is two thirds the length of supposedly what the Ark was. Let's talk about why the Wyoming was so unwieldy. The Wyoming sucked. It sucked as a ship. And the reason why it sucked so bad is because it was so big. It was so massive that the long planks of the Wyoming would twist and buckle in the heavy seas. So you can imagine the seas bucking and tossing the ship around. And because it was so long, the, the, the all the planks would be, be twisting and buckling and creating gaps, which meant that there was seawater that would continuously flow into the hold. They would use pumps. They had pumps built into the ship. They had to operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in order to keep the hold relatively free of water. 
It required a crew of hundreds to build it. And this is even using you know, relatively modern technology. It also required steel braces. There were 90 steel braces all along the inside of the hull trying to prevent those long planks from buckling and, and, and bending. Now, this didn't exist back in Noah's day. So the reason why it sucks so bad is, is plainly obvious. And in fact, it only took 15 years in March of, tw of, of 1924 that it sank and it killed everyone on board. Okay, so that's the Wyoming. So let's talk about the Ark. So we're supposed to believe that the Ark was 50% larger than the largest wooden ship ever built, that it was built by four dudes, even if they were giants, right? Okay, whatever that means. Um, it was built around 4,400 years ago, which meant that it was limited to the technology used at the time, right? By these four dudes. And that it was manned by eight people, right? Noah and his sons and their wives at sea for over a year. Let's just ignore the animal part, right? Just imagine eight people trying to man this ship for over a year at sea. Okay, let's get to the animals, right? Because that's the whole point. The ark had to be big enough to have room for all the quote unquote kinds, right? Well, hopefully we'll get into what that means. It also had to include all their food. That's in the Bible too, that Noah had to go out and collect all the food for the different animals. It also had to have enough fresh water for all the animals for them to sit in the ark for over a year. They had to keep predators away from prey, right? You had to also manage their waste. These animals would end up making huge amounts of waste, right? The ark obviously is like going to be filled with waste. You could just imagine what the ark would smell like after a single day. And imagine after a year what all of that would smell like. So how do we know that the ark didn't exist? There are lots of different reasons. So that, that all that was just about the feasibility. Like it just doesn't make sense. How do we know it didn't exist? The thing is, there's too many ways to count. And that's what I plan to get into. We're going to talk about that today in the open discussion. But there's one way we do know. So the thing, like, we can, if one of the claims of the Ark is that it had to carry all the animals and that the animals today are descended from animals that were on the Ark, we should be able to use molecular clocks in order to figure out, does that correspond with them descended from uh, a common ancestor that was on the Ark 4,400 years ago? And the thing is, molecular clocks, they actually correspond really well with other lines of evidence. So this is a diagram showing millions of years ago with certain kinds of, of uh, splits that we know that have occurred within the fossil record. So I know that this is generally considered to be the split between the placental mammals and the marsupial mammals. Um, the nucleotide sequence substitutions, we can also compare extant animals today, that meaning that they're alive today, and compare pairs of animals for when we would think that their last common ancestor is based on when the on the fossil evidence. And we see a, a huge, an overwhelmingly tight correlation for this data across a long span of lifespan. So we have very consistent fossil evidence that not all animals were descended from a single common ancestor uh, or common ancestors from 4,400 years ago. And in fact, it's highly consistent with the, uh, with the fossil record. So that's the thing. There are many lines of evidence that support phylogenetic sequencing. This is an example of what the phylogenetic sequencing looks like when you compare humans to chimpanzees or humans to mice. So then we got the mammals all here. And then of course, humans to say chickens or say reptiles. And then you can compare them to my favorite species, the frog. Um, and then down to fish, right? So we got the vertebrates and we can even include invertebrates in this. And the molecular data shows that there was, must have been a single common ancestor. But when we want to talk about molecular data, as far as the arc is concerned and within kinds, I'm going to show you that there's no way that this can work. So the thing is, genetic sequences result in a pattern that precludes the divergence of animals from Noah's Ark. It just doesn't make sense. And Kyle, he's going to have to explain that, okay? And hopefully he'll he'll be able to do that. We'll see. So the other thing about humanity is that genetic evidence doesn't support that that all that all human beings are are descended from anim, uh, from people that were on the Ark. And you're right. So we can always focus that there was Adam and Eve, right? And that Adam and Eve are the father of all of humanity. At least that's what Kyle seemed to indicate. There's a long lineage that gets to Noah. But remember, everyone was killed in the Great Flood, right? Except for Noah and his three sons and their wives. So everyone is actually descended from these guys down here. This is the real genetic bottleneck, not just for humanity, but for all animals, right? Genesis 7.14. They, Noah and his his uh, his little homeboys, his 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 kids, <laughs> they had to have with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, 
every creature that moves along the ground, right? Every creature according to its kind and every bird according to its kind. And actually another verse that actually says that birds had to be brought in seven pairs, not just uh, pairs of animals. There's a lot of reasons why the ark doesn't make sense, but creationists claim that they had two male and female of each kind of animal on the ark 4,400 years ago. They claim that biodiversity that we see today must have emerged from those original kinds. This means that not only do they believe in evolution, but they obviously believe in like hyper evolution. The problem is there has not been enough time for this level of speciation. And I know, Kyle, okay. you said that we didn't have 200 breeds of dogs uh, or, sorry, 360 breeds of dogs 200 years ago. That actually isn't true. I mean, I imagine that maybe there's been a few emergencies of a couple of different breeds, but we had nearly every breed around 200 years ago. We'll get into that. I'm happy to talk about it and hopefully correct some of these misconceptions that you have. And I'm happy to end it there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, both Dr. Chris and Kyle Adams. We are now going to break into our open discussion, but please keep on sending in those chat questions or super chats to get you sent to the top of the list. And don't forget to like, file, and subscribe. But with that, gentlemen, the floor is both of yours. Okay, so you're saying that the Ark wasn't big enough. Mm -hmm. So how big do you claim the Ark needed to be? That's a great question. And actually, you know, we're talking about something fantasy from fantasy world. So I kind of want to get what your impression is, because I actually don't think that it existed. You said that there were only so many animals on the Ark, right? Now, okay, first of all, are you a, are you a biblical literalist? Do you believe that the Bible was like literally true? There are parables in the Bible. There are okay. some parables. And, uh, Do you yeah. think there's any parables within Genesis 6 and Genesis 7? Uh, no, not really. No. I, I don't okay. like, yeah, this is kind of like one of those really key pivotal points. And uh, it's very doctrinal talking about the baptism of the earth. And sure. yeah, the, even Christ referred to this moment as, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. All right. So you believe that like I, like well, the way it's written in the Bible, it had to happen that way. You're not going to weasel out like the way other creationists do on certain verses. Is that right? Weasel out on certain. Verses. Yeah. So, OK, what was on the ark? Why don't you tell me what, what kind of animals were on the ark? We had people and we had animals. I don't know what kind of animals were on the earth. In were there days. any plants that were on the ark? They had food for them, and so there were some okay. some plants that they kept as food. So whether when grain the flood or, I don't occurred, know. did any plants survive on the earth? Um, it says here that uh, he went out and collected seeds. Right. And I can try and find that verse if you want me to. That he went out and collected seeds uh, for different plants to take with him. What about uh, insects? Do you think insects were on the ark? Did he have to collect insects? Uh, I... I consider them to be an animal, so sure. I'm so okay. not. Do you know how many different kinds of insects there are? I don't, nor do I know how many were on the earth in those days. Uh, what is a kind? Can we get to that? Exactly. What is a kind? And that's one of yes. those kind of things with presentism that I kind of addressed before is we have a huge phylogenic system today, mm -hmm. but we don't, you know, to, to assume that they grouped everything by the exact same phylogenic system that we use today that's presentism all right and so it doesn't still specify. what's a kind all right so when the bible says that noah brought kinds onto the ark what, do, what does that mean so and talk about know. like like animals so are there species today that were on the ark or at least like you know that were present back then four thousand four hundred years ago First of all, do you believe that that's the case? Do you think that there are the, like, because most creationists believe it was around 4,400 years ago, and you have to do that because of the timing, right? There's there's clearly descendants of Noah that eventually led to, like, the Israelites, and they say, like, this guy begat that guy, and that guy begat that guy. So they've gone through all of this. So I assume you believe yes. all that's true, right? Yeah. The the, the genealogy in there is, I, I think the genealogy in there is as okay. correct as it can be. And Right. Uh, so, the, so the flood, the great flood had to happen 4,400 years ago. I don't, Approximately, right? I'm, I'm not convinced because if we just look at calendars, okay, did they use the same calendar that we do today? You know, that's another instance of presentism. Our mm -hmm. calendar is different. Like 
from the Hebrew calendar for starters. And exactly. Is this, is this the reason why, like when they said Noah you know? was like 900 years old, that maybe he actually wasn't because they had different calendars. That is a possibility, but they but they still called him, you know, someone who was of old. And so they, they did emphasize a lot on how, uh, how he lived for a long time. Okay. And so I, I think that's going to be true no matter All right. you know, what calendar so they use. I, I don't know if you know what you're agreeing to, because like what you're saying is vastly different than most creationists actually say. And I don't think that you're well, well read up on this topic. Um, you probably would have benefited from actually reading like what other creationists have to say, because you kind of walked yourself into like some really severe impossibilities for this to be an actual true story. Now, creationists know okay. this. So you've kind because of totally ignored they, my question. They say like, no, of course there weren't insects on the ark because it would be ludicrous to imagine that the vast, vast, vast diversity that we see just amongst the arthropods, that that would have to be on the ark, right? That is assuming you're you're kind of looking at it with presentism eyes. Presentism, um, okay. Yeah. Presentism, yes. Mm -hmm. That That is judging it by today's standards, something a long time ago that didn't, that where okay. today's standards didn't apply. All right. Listen, how, let me just ask you this. Do you know how many different species of beetles there are? Today? No, I don't. Yes, today. Yeah. Just the beetles. And I'm not talking about George and Ringo and, right? I'm talking about like the bugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beetles. Take a guess. Uh, I don't know why it's really guess, important. Just the, guess. The, the really important thing is. A hundred? Is it more than a hundred? Okay. Again, it depends on how big you think the arc needed to be. That's the main thing. Yeah. Here. And you can't even tell me like how big the arc would need to be in order to be a feasible thing. Okay. So you could say there are, you know, a billion beetles on the earth today, Kate. Okay? And so that well, would more still, than a billion, say, but like for different species, it's around 300,000 described species, 300,000 different described species. Okay. And obviously they would have to have okay. descended from what, like a single pair that was on the arc 4,400 years ago. Is that what you're trying to claim? Uh, I don't know how it all works, really. <laughs> so okay, man. Yeah, I don't know how it all works here. Okay, exactly, exactly. So, and that's just the beetles, right? So we've got true bugs. You've got mosquitoes. You've got uh, uh, mantids. Uh, you know, all of these different groups of insects. Just the insects is clearly thousands and thousands of different described species. And that's the described. We we know that there's a lot that is undescribed because there's vast uh, areas of the tropics that have not actually been thoroughly looked at. And so we know that there's probably twice as many additional species of the beetles, at least, um, in, in these areas. And so we're talking about literally millions of different species. So there has to be an explanation for like, how did we days. get those just from the flood, right? Like, did Noah have them on the ark? Right. And I, cause like, okay. So you said that they were on the ark because, um, because they, they, you know, they were the things creepy crawly on the ground and they had to come on the ark. Isn't that right? Uh, yeah, that's okay. my understanding of it. Didn't say that, oh, we're going to, we're not going to, we're going to leave all the bugs. It doesn't, it never sure. excludes them. Right. Like, cause it would make no sense that uh there'd be bugs today and, and, and like they were all killed in the flood because they were not on the ark. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there were only pairs, right? Because they can only come in pairs. I assume bugs are unclean animals. Well, are they clean? What do you think? Uh, John the Baptist ate locusts, right? So if he's sense? eating locusts, that's... Okay. Uh, a so they would have seven pairs of the, of, the, of the locusts. Now, okay, I don't know how much you know about uh, entomology, but there's quite a few different kinds of insects that are parasitic, and that's the only way that they can survive. So are you familiar with parasitic wasps? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you know how they reproduce, right? Do you know that there are parasitic wasps in those days, or that there were any well, kind I mean, of like parasitic in insects in those days? You tell me, man. You That's your that. story. Hey, it's it, you're the one who's. I think that there were parasitic wasps four thousand four hundred years ago. Yes. Okay. That's a nice theory, but do you have any like evidence? For sure, this? we can look at molecular evidence. Let's get to the molecular evidence. Do you have any fossils of them is what I'm trying to say. Oh, like, so, I mean, we don't necessarily need fossil evidence to know that, like, say, parasitic wasps must have existed 4,400 years ago. There's something known as molecular clocks that allow us to determine these things. Do you have any idea how a molecular clock works? No. Okay. So, 
if there was a common ancestor, right? Uh, maybe, I mean, it would be all right if I share again. I, it, it's easier for me to just show it if Absolutely. that's possible. Right. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. All righty. Boom. Let's get to this. And sorry to get into professor lecture mode, but you know, I am a professor and uh, it's uh, almost impossible for me to have a conversation without PowerPoint in front of me. So molecular clocks allow us to estimate when there was a last common ancestor. Okay. So in genetic sequence, right, the, the genome is made up of C's, A's, T's, and G's. So you can imagine maybe there was some sort of ancestral gene like this, and the two populations may have diverged. You know, amongst evolutionary biologists, that population may have just split uh, around 50 million years ago. When those population splits, now they're completely isolated, you're going to get random insertions, okay? So mutations will occur, and if they re are retained and passed on to the next generation, those are now insertion events, okay? Or or, or there's a change, okay? A change that's incurred. They're, they're not necessarily insertions. They can be substitutions as well, or deletions. What we're looking at here are changes, okay? So a random mutation. So this T is now a G in this lineage, and this G is now a T over here. And then over time, there's going to be a certain rate at which this occurs, right? So another stretch of time, now we've got like another, say, 20 million years that has passed, and now we have more mutations that have accumulated. And so eventually what we do is that we can compare the sequence from the, uh, the lineage, you know, currently, we can look at this lineage and compare it to this lineage to see are they similar to each other. And that's how we can tell uh, a molecular clock. Now, the thing is, all right, if I can get, since I'm here, I'm just going to kind of go fast forward a little bit. I know we're going through a lot of stuff. Uh, okay, back up. All right, so let's get to about kinds, okay? So, um, Kyle, how many different kinds of bears do you think were on the ark? I think that's irrelevant. The question that is important here is how big do you think the ark needed to be in order yeah, to fit? Right, and it, yeah. the only way that we can determine that is actually if there were enough it was it big enough to accommodate the different kinds, right? So we have to determine how many kinds were on the ark. So, for instance, I don't think that like um, that like there was a kind of bear that was created, and that there were only there was only a pair of them on the ark, right? I obviously believe that bears and other animals shared a common ancestor. What do you think? Do you think that bears were specially created, or do you think that they shared uh, a common ancestor with some other kind? say like the other uh, carnivores, because bears are think, a carnivore. Well, I kind of view bears kind of similar to dogs. I think a lot of dogs sure. end up going back. And their and molecular they, DNA is actually breeding. quite similar too. You compare yeah. the molecular sequences of say polar bears or brown bears, and you compare them to say dogs or wolves or, or lions, they're going to be more similar than any of them are to say human beings. Would okay. you agree with so, that? I mean, obviously so like that's the data. Okay, so we can just... First off, kind of, if you want to say, go with the presentism kind of terms, you can kind of establish how big you think an arc would have needed to be in order to be feasible in by today's standards. Okay. Sure. And so that, that's a good starting basis. And then after you decide, okay, well, this is what, how big it would have to be by today's standards. And then so. we can kind of make a judgment call on, okay, okay, well, that is with all the animals and we're, on the world today so now let's kind of try to reconsider how many animals we really think were on the earth in those days if there were more or less and then we can kind of adjust those standards to uh yeah and we can kind of shrink that down to where it would be feasible in, in those days and so I, I think that's a good way to address things so by today's standards how big do you think the arc would have needed to be in order to be feasible so okay i Honestly, I have no idea because it okay. doesn't make any sense to me because I okay. know that evolution works far too slowly to accommodate the rapid diversification that creationists require in order for them to have be descended from kinds. I don't think that it actually makes a whole lot of sense to start from like, oh, couldn't the ark be big enough to have all the different species? I mean, it would have to be massive to include today's species. That's for sure. And well, also, saying it's food. not going to be massive. Everyone's mm -hmm. saying it'd have to be a lot bigger than really what's big. described in the Bible. That's for sure. The, well, Kyle, there's a reason why creationists talk about that like they there were only so many kinds on the ark there were only babies right they talk about how they were hibernating during that time like I, these are all the arguments i was kind of expecting you to come up with like because these are the basic ones but we're going way 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 back and there's no way that you could possibly have like pairs of polar bears pairs of brown bears pairs of american black bears pairs of asian black bears pairs You're of just saying bears. that there's no way because you don't 
on the arc. Away. Yes, like along with well, all the other species. But okay, let's let's get to the feasibility a little bit, just with the bears. Okay, have you ever like talked to a zookeeper that keeps and maintains bears? Have I ever talked to one? No. Yeah, or like seen a documentary on like bears and zoos or something like that. Do you, what do you think it would take to like keep and maintain a pair of bears anywhere, like in a zoo? I don't know. Yeah. Think about it. Like, uh -huh. do you think they're like just friendly that you can just be like, okay, little bears, let's just kind of go along boop, 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 into your little cage. I think bears are an interesting one because you uh -huh. are the one who brought up hibernating and bears are a specific sure. species. Okay, well, then we got the hibernating hibernate. part, but not all of them actually hibernate. So pandas okay. don't hibernate. Spectacle bears yeah. don't hibernate. Okay. Nonetheless, you're kind of avoiding how big the ark would have needed to be in order to be feasible. No, I am trying to get to it because we need to know how many animals were on the ark in order for it to even fit, right? Okay, so we're okay. just... Let's just look at all of these different but species that you've got here. I'm, okay. So I am trying to get on a point of like the feasibility of managing these kinds of animals on the ark. And not just these. We're talking about crazy predators like cobras and scorpions. And I mean, like, because you also have to include um, parasites, right? Like there had to be pairs of, say, the guinea worm. Do you know what the guinea worm is? No. Okay. The guinea worm is a parasitic worm that infects human beings by um, uh, passing through the our gut when we drink dirty water that has little fleas in it. So the little fleas are carrying the tiny little guinea worm, okay? We swallow them. The fleas get digested in our gut, but then the guinea worm comes out. So this, this is some of the beauty of creation, okay? So That's the guinea worm comes out of the gut, and then it starts crawling through our circulatory system, gets down to our lower extremities, and then, and then gets to the skin and creates this boil that becomes really, really painful to the human beings that have this. Okay, so then it just gets bigger and bigger crawling inside the skin. The human beings then are in so much pain that they're like, ah, oh, I gotta get some water. I gotta go and like, they go into like a pond and then they start washing themselves to help leave like the pain. And then the guinea worm has like these little hydroreceptors that sense, oh, the human being is now in water. What I'm gonna do is now release my little babies out into the water. So they release these tiny, tiny, tiny little, little nubbins that then get eat up eaten up by the fleas that live in the water. And then the cycle continues. I assume that there must have been guinea worms on the ark, right? I mean, if Noah set, was no, when Noah was commanded by, by God to carry all the guinea worms on the ark, tell me how like he kept those guinea worms on the ark. Well, was he you, carrying them? Okay, if you can let me talk. Sure, uh, sure. You have the floor. Right. So here you're kind of under this huge impression that... Uh, no other animals were created since that time. But when I think about Moses, okay, and the plagues of Egypt, uh, it talked about the dust of the earth kind of becoming like fleas and flies, right? So that kind of tells me that something was created after the flood. Okay. So wait, you're telling me the parasites and were created after the flood. Who created the parasites then? Who created them? Well, yeah. I'm just you know, looking at the like the whole plague in, in Egypt, right? And the flies were created, or the, the lice. I don't know. I have to go back and use the exact reference so I can I tell mean, you exactly what, what bug it was. Uh, but it was describing this as being created from the dust. And so that was the power of God who created that as a plague to Pharaoh. Okay. So God created the guinea worm, right? I don't know why not. Sure. So how did Noah keep the guinea worms and the other parasites, just human parasites on the ark? Okay. They, and they only had to come in right. pairs, right? You're, you're he was commanded that what they I just could said. only come in pairs. You're ignoring the point of what I just said. I, it, yeah, kind of, because I don't see any point in it and its relevance to this. Um, you're I, trying to I, say I, that God that. created the, the, um, the plague and that that happened after the flood. I don't necessarily yes. think that that also means that means all parasites were then also created after the flood. And the other I'm thing is, saying, so Kyle, just we're just saying, talking about you're... human parasites. Every single animal species has parasites that generally or will oftentimes specialize on them and their close relatives. Okay, We have to I'm include just... them too. I'm just telling you that there are certain animals that were described as being created okay. after the flood. It doesn't say all animals were created before the flood. And so, right. But the yeah. parasites would have to be on the ark as well. Some of them. 
Some of them, yeah, maybe okay, unless those, right. unless those parasites were created after the flood. After, so you've got right. this huge. So you're saying you've got, there's like a lot of creation that happens after the flood. So there are no God parasites stays there that, without beginning of or big or yeah. God's works never cease. Is kind of uh, a huge statement here. Okay. God's works are without end, and his words species never species cease. Just being okay. poofed out of out of nothingness. Like I don't today? claim that. I don't claim that. Anything I mean, that is what you're claiming. You're claiming no, that like there's not. there's some magic that occurred, and that the parasites were just they just kind of came about, and that God created all the parasites after the flood. I'm saying that He created some animals uh, after the flood, and so yeah, I well, don't have any issue with that. Is that is that described in the Bible? That, that I just you're just making this just up. You're you. like it's like you know how like okay the Star Wars nerds they get all into like oh you know like they're the different kinds of aliens do this and that. And then they create like this sort of background story. And like, in order to explain some kind of random stupid thing that's in the movie, that's kind of sounds like what you're doing to me. Like you're trying to sort of pigeonhole all this by just making it stuff up. I didn't make anything up here. You I did. told you, I gave you a reference in the Bible. Okay. And you kind of Thanks. are uh, uh, upset with me. So, because you are not familiar with this reference. Okay. So let's see. Do you believe that the bears share a common ancestor? Do I believe that the bears share a common ancestor? Yes. I These different there's... species of bears. There's eight different living species of bears. I'm not entirely sure. I think there's some good evidence for that that whole suggestion. Sure. What do you think might be some of that evidence? I think there's a lot of similarities between the different species and uh, of, of bears. And so I just look at a grizzly bear and a black bear and I think, wow, you know, I think those two might have been able to interbreed at one point if they can't interbreed today. Well, okay, let's talk about it. All right, so there has been some work on this. We can look at the genetic sequences of these animals. And if we look at the genetic sequence of certain, you know, introns, so that's like genetic sequences um, that count that actually code for protein um, amongst the different species of bears. You can, you can create a phylogenetic tree. And this is because we know that there's a certain rate of mutation that occurs in these animals. We can monitor this over time. We know that this is stable, right? So that's part of the clock. Now, if you look at these six different species of bears, they have a relatively recent common ancestor, that's for sure, because we can compare the genetic sequences and just realize like it would take this much time for the common ancestor between polar bears and uh, brown bears to have diverged. And then American black bears are sort of the outgroup from that. And this is the North American bear. So it makes sense, right? And then we have these Asian bears. These are Asian bears. We got the sun bear, the sloth bear, and the Asian black bear. And it makes sense that they would kind of be sort of related to each other. But now we got the spectacled bear, which is in South America. And then we got the giant panda. If you include them, so, okay, this is what we know. So the last common ancestor between polar bears and brown bears, based on their mutation rates today, must have been around 620,000 years ago. 940,000 years ago, and then 107, uh, 1.7 million years ago for um, the last common ancestor between the North American bears and the South, and then the Asian bears. So let's just fill this in. Then we have the spectacle bear. When we look at their genetic sequence, they are the outgroup of this major clade. So the spectacle bear, based on their genetic sequence, that last common ancestor between them and the rest of these guys must have lived around 5.8 million years ago. And then we have the giant panda. Let me include that. That was around 12.5 million years ago. Okay. And so here's the overall sequence. And here's the citation for this. Now, the thing is, um, if we wanted to say that like they all descended from a single common ancestor in Noah's flood, you still have to account for the molecular data. You still have to do this. And we can do this for any group of animals. So if you're going to pretend that like the animals might have rapidly diverged in such a quick uh, you know, sequence, and, and we can look at the molecular data to see if this is genuinely true, because there's going to be a tree that comes about. So if, if, we, if we just pretend for the moment that the last common ancestor between giant pandas and the rest of the uh, bears was 4,400 years ago, well, that must mean that the last common ancestor between the spectacle bear and the other bears was 2,000 years ago. So we're already talking around the time of Jesus, right? And then for these other bears, they would have to have emerged in more or less the modern era. And in fact, the last common ancestor between polar bears and brown bears would have had to have been 1796 after the founding of the United States. It would mean that there were no polar bears back then for based on the molecular data. 
So, but we know this isn't true. Like we know that polar bears have been around a very long time. Here's drawings of Dutch sailors killing polar bears from the 1600s and the 1700s. And these are over 1000 year old carvings of polar bear statuettes carved from Ivy in Canada. So I'm gonna stop sharing there just because I know I've been occupying the screen there a bit, but I, I kind of want to get through that, right? You see what I'm saying? Like the molecular data does not make sense and precludes any idea that there must've been like a single common ancestor for bears on the ark. And that we're only talking about a group that has eight species in it. Now, if you want to talk not, about other I'm comments, not at ruling the possibility that all these different species of bear were on the ark. Okay. I'm not at no, ruling. You are that. saying that there might've been like eight different groups of uh, species of bears. I'm I'm open for exploring this. Sure. I'm open so the, for exploring is, multiple species on the sure. on the arc. Right. You know, I'm even open for exploring this in modern day standards. Okay. Right. And so, yeah, that's why I said it's about the feasibility. How big do you claim the arc would have needed to be according to modern day standards? Yeah. I mean, it would have to be. Like, every time I ask you that question, you ignore that. Yeah. No, because I, I think it's massive. First of all, I think the idea of could we fit all these species on the arc? I think I already showed my intro that no, you couldn't because the largest wooden boat that we ever built only lasted 15 years and it was a pain in the ass and required like these steel structures to keep it from actually sinking at sea. And it was only two thirds the size of the ark. Now, one thing about the Bible, okay, you say you believe in the Bible, so let's talk about that. Um, one thing about the Bible is that there is a quote um, what do they use to build? Like, we're, we're getting back to the feasibility. All right. I know that you don't want to talk about like the possibility of it, um, but we can talk about the feasibility. So um, what did they use to seal the ark? Do you remember that? I, I see you're talking. That's okay. We can wait. I'm sorry. What? No, it's okay. So do you know what they use to seal the ark? Right, because well, a wooden boat has to be sealed, right? It, do it doesn't actually say. It just says a covering. And so no, you that's can look true. at the... It says in the King James Version, but not in the original Hebrew. Well, what does Genesis look at the original 6, Hebrew, 14 say? It just says a covering. It doesn't okay. say a covering. No. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 14, it says it was covered in pitch. However, pitch. that's not in the original Hebrew. That was okay. added by the King, the Council of King James. They decided to say, oh, well, it was pitch. And yeah, but it, it doesn't say that in the original. So what Hebrew. kind of covering do you think they used, if not pitch? Because it just that says is, a covering. Because it's fair, because like ancient boats did use pitch. Like we know that. We can look at archaeological evidence and that pitch was commonly used by ancient shape, shipbuilders. Yeah, and so that was an assumption that the Council of King James said, but okay. in, so it what just was says a covering. covering. Okay. It doesn't say. I'm not going to I'm not going to say something that Do you think that say. they used pitch? I don't know if they used pitch or not. What do you think? I mean, the, all, all the archaeological evidence indicates that ancient shipbuilders used pitch. Like, we can look at archaeological evidence from Egypt, for instance. Those are some of the oldest wooden boats that we know of, like real uh -huh. boats, like we're talking about. They use pitch for a lot of those. Yeah. Yeah. So pitch, do you know what pitch is? Pitch, like tar, is kind of my understanding of pitch. Right. It's kind of yeah. tar, like an oil-based kind exactly. of substance. Exactly, petroleum-based. Right. Yeah. Now, do you believe that there was pitch prior to the flood? That there was pitch prior to the flood? Yes. I don't see any indicators saying that there was no pitch prior to do the flood. Do you believe that there was like oil and gas and coal prior to the flood? Yeah. Why do you believe that? Why do I think there's oil yeah. and gas? Like, where do you think the oil and gas and coal comes from? Well, oil, you can get oil from grape seeds. Like, you've ever heard of grapeseed oil or yeah, olive that's oil? That's not the kind of like oil I'm talking about. I'm it's talking oil. About, like, it is oil. Shoot. And so, oil is in like, it's just. Yes, kind there's plant derived different. oils. Yes. We're yeah. talking about petroleum based oils. Yeah. And so, there's, there's a difference. Also, yeah. But none yes. of, I see no indicators saying that none of that would be around before the flood. Where does it come from then? The earth? Yeah, okay yes how did it get into the earth <laughs> that's a really good question uh yeah yes. some people say Do you know what creationists kind of... believe i am a creationist okay so, all right yeah. well i'm doubting that now but um uh what what do what do other creationists believe do you have any idea what they say on this doesn't really matter because I, there's a lot of it does matter out there because we're talking about the Bible and like like this part of the Bible like whether this is really true. Well, you're talking to says, me here. You're not talking mm -hmm. to anyone else. And so sure, there's a sure, lot sure. Of okay, religions so, like, out there who view this in different okay. ways. So, and so yeah, I am you, definitely you, not okay. Kent Hovind. I am not Rob Skiba. I, I am yes, not. Glad you're not Kent Hovind. I appreciate that, and yeah, I don't I'm, even know I'm if you the Pope. Okay, so, so there's a lot of different people out there who have different views of things. Sure, and yeah.
okay. I don't know how many views you actually have because you're not actually answering many questions, but let's get to this a little bit. All right. So petroleum is, uh, let's talk about coal. Let's just start there, right? Okay. So we're not talking about oils from seed or whatever. There's no confusion about what coal is, right? Do you know what coal is? Yeah. What is coal? It's like a hard, um, it's a hard Rock. substance that you burn. Right. In order to, where does it yeah. come from though? The ground. Oh my God. No, where did it like, how did it get into the ground? That's a really good topic right there. It is. Uh, yes. What do, what do yeah. geologists at least believe? Um, geologists today kind of say different things. And so some people like, uh, they don't. like they really don't. Yeah, they do. And no. so there are some, okay, well, you want me to please? Yes, questions? go ahead. If you, if you list the, the various things that geologists say about how coal, uh, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking back to the days of Rockefeller and how he's all claiming it's all fossil fuel. But yeah, as we kind of study into that today, is it really fossil fuel? Is it really that limited? Is it all coming from fossils? I'm not convinced. You're not convinced that coal is derived from like what? You know, ancient plant material from uh, around 300 million make, years plus a, we ago. We can make coal today. As yeah, as sure. You can get yeah. like burnt plant material and make like coal, but that's not like the hardened rock from pressure that is coal that you can dig out of the ground. It's not the same. It's mm -hmm. not the same. Yeah. And the thing is, like when you go to these coal beds, like the thing, okay, look, I encourage you. Maybe I, I, you're in Utah, I think, right? Are you in Utah? Yeah, I'm in Utah. Okay. And I don't know if there's available coal deposits that you can look at there, but I'm in Appalachia. It's known for its coal deposits. I spent last week at a coal deposit here, just south of Blacksburg, where I'm at, uh, digging and looking for fossils. And I could find all kinds of really interesting plant fossils, examples of plants that do not exist today. And it's in the coal layers because that's all plant material that was tightly compressed. And, and, and then all the, that carbon that made up that plant material is highly then pressurized to create essentially a rock that has a lot of energy in it that we can burn and use because it's mostly just carbon. Very different from like other rock. And that's how we know, geologists will say, that this is derived from fossils. So, and I've seen it with my hands. I, I like see, I touched it with my hands and seen it with my eyes. So, and I encourage you to go out and take a look too. Like, you know, to say that like you can just make coal, you would not be able to make something like this. Okay. Now, creationists generally believe that all that must have emerged during the Great Flood. Right? I'm not convinced. <laughs> when, when did, it come, did you think God just made it with the, the coal in the ground? Well, I don't believe God poofed the earth into existence. Okay. And so I don't, yeah. And so a lot of creationists out there, as you claim, believe that God just poofed everything into existence, but mm. that's not, and that's not, I, for, for me, that conveys this concept of a God who literally sat around for an infinite amount of time before Genesis 1-1, okay, sat around for an infinite amount of time doing absolutely nothing, okay? A God who sits around for an infinite amount of time forever, kind of in the past, before Genesis 1-1, that's, that's like equivalent to a dead God. That's, you know, death is not doing anything. I right? must have been pretty boring. Yeah. And so I don't believe God is the kind of being that would do that. You know, his works are without end, without beginning of days or end of years. And so, yeah, that tells me right there that the earth, it doesn't say that the earth was created out of nothing. That's totally preposterous. And so, yeah, he could have taken things that... uh like a sandbox and say, okay, well, let's kind of make something out of this material that's here. Right. Okay. So like when it talks about on Genesis one, the different days, what do you think that that is? Like, is that allegory? Is that the part where you talk about, or is this a calendar issue that you were talking about? Well, like, cause you said the calendars must've been very different, like presentism, right. That we have what a day looks like today, but maybe back then a day was who knows how long, right. I, I, People, it's really easy to kind of look at things and say, okay, well, we see the length of time, okay, for the sun to be in, in the sky, right, from from morning to uh, from morning to evening, and that is one time. But even by today's standards, that length of time, a day, is a different time frame, uh, depending on where you are in the world. 
Okay. And so if you are out in Alaska, there are times when you have very little sunlight, okay, compared to being on uh, the equator, right? If you're on the equator, you see a lot more day. And so when you actually look at the Hebrew and you look at how they define day, this is the kind of the time frame of, it's not, they don't consider a day to be 24 hours. Okay. It's the, the, the time that you see the sun in the sky. Okay. And so there's, that is day. Okay, the time that you see the sun in the sky. And so how long is a day? Uh, yeah, on okay, a day on the equator is going to be a longer time period than a day is going to be at, say, the North Pole. Okay? Sure. But like that also means that it's it still has to be less than 24 hours, right? At, at, at most. Less than 24 hours. It has to be at most 24 hours. Like, for instance, if you're above the Arctic Circle and it is you know, summer, then days will be longer. Um, and especially if you're like towards the uh, summer solstice, um, days will be longer or they're going to be like not non-ending, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, you get okay. it. You get it. So can you, can you imagine trying to, can you imagine? <laughs> you can still watch the sun go all the way around and it'll still take 24 hours for it to go but all they the way don't, around. That's not how they, that's not how they define the word day in Hebrew. You could still do it though, man. Like that's the thing. Like if you look There's south and you look at where the sun is, and then you sit there, and even though you're in the Arctic Circle, like you could still sit there and just go around like this, twenty four hours, boop, 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 boop. and twenty four hours later, it'll be right there. Like that's but how that's not how they define the word day, okay? Oh, and so okay. that that could happen five times or something like that, right? But that would still just be one day because you're that's a good presentism. You have to look at the way they define things compared right. to the way we define things because language itself changes over time. Kyle, let's go back to the feasibility part a little bit about the ARC and try to get back onto the topic. The ARC. All right. What, you were talking about that Noah was a giant, I believe, and that therefore cubits must have been bigger because his arm was bigger, right? That, at well, least you yeah, were suggesting says, that that's a okay. possibility. So uh, I forgot to mention this before, okay? But the sons of God, okay? Uh, Rob Skiba likes to point at them and say, oh, well, these are fallen angels and, and giants are the re result of uh fallen angels interbreeding with man and i don't i don't i as much as i love rob skiba he says a lot of things that are right i disagree with him on this because we get the the uh the reference in romans 8 14 it says for as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god okay as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god and so uh this right here if we apply romans 8 14 to our scripture in genesis six. Yeah. yeah so uh yeah we'd have so then, no that would mean that the like they're referring to the sons of god would have have to have been descended of the the they have i don't know influence but okay all right does, does that those mean, who are led by the spirit of god came into those that were not led with the spirit of god uh that they became mighty men and they lived long lives and right. were famous which yeah. definitely describes noah and his family okay so Right. I'm trying to get tight to the size of the ark. How do you think Noah and his family, like, cause I, I'm basing like my estimation of what the, how big the ark was based on like biblical scholars and what their understanding of what a cubit is. And it's around 500 feet. I've seen some estimates that might be a little bit less, maybe more like 450, but most scholars seem to indicate that Noah is more like 510 feet. Right. So that's a pretty big boat. That's Would you agree? Not most, yeah, those people who are making you're saying it could be even are bigger. assuming, oh yeah, definitely, way sure. bigger. How yeah. could you possibly have a wooden boat that big when we know that the biggest boat ever built by human beings would, was like almost unwieldy to use? Okay, so that was made out of a certain kind of wood. It doesn't say right. that they made that boat out of gopher wood. And so whatever gopher wood was in those days, okay, it, it's kind of wrong to assume that uh because you this would this boat made out of this kind of wood is going to behave the same as this boat that is made out of a completely different kind of wood oak is going to be different than pine wood right? yes I, I understand that but like all woods have certain level of flex and torsion that can occur before they actually break that's part of the reason why they can be used so well for like creating um yeah. you know like uh nautically shaped boats uh, that can pass through the sea quite well, right? Because you can flex and bend them to make them and shape them so that they can actually fit into the shape that you want to give it some sort of like, you know, 
not aerodynamic, but like sea dynamic. I don't know what that term is. I'm not a nautical engineer. I have no idea. Yeah. So, but like, okay, even if it's gopher wood, it would still have to have that flexible capability, wouldn't it? That's kind of flexible. Sure. Yeah. And uh, so then how was it? Of... Mm -hmm. So did they have pumps to make sure that it was constantly being emptied? Because that was the thing that you have to do with the six mass schooners. And those so, boats are a fraction of what the, you're talking about. Uh, it doesn't make I'm any not, sense. You know I'm getting at? Okay. Like this, well, okay. Uh, did they use nails for, for making this, this arc? That's another question. Did they use nails? Because if, whether or not you're using nails. They uh, have used nails. Well, I think that definitely. They use nails on the, uh, on the schooners. Yeah. And so and they still there suffered are different from ways like to, constant yeah. leaking. There are ways to construct things that are going to be more integrally sound than other that. things. And, what is huh? what is that? What is that going to look like for such a massive ship that would be uh, three just, times the size of like, because I think that's what you're talking about. If Noah's a giant, must have built an ark that was like three times the size of the, the Wyoming, this, this six mass schooner, right? For sure, yeah. Yeah, so, so okay. I, I don't have any problems with well, that. Well, according so, to biblical scholars, it would only be about 50% larger, but you're suggesting it could be as much as like three times the size. So now we're talking about a ship that is like bigger than almost any boat that like has ever been created. And we know that those giant boats were so unwieldy. Like there's a reason why they, they only built just a handful. You're just of. looking at one boat, really. No, we're, we're talking about like many, many boats. There were actually several. Oh, you've only mentioned there. one boat that was really unwieldy that needed to be constantly. Yes, I mentioned the Wyoming, but all of them suffered from this. I actually looked, you know, in preparation for this debate, I get, I get way into this stuff. Like I start looking and like trying to find details about the company that built the boat. So they had built a bunch of five mass schooners and six mass schooners. And there's a long list of like, like the result of what happened with all these schooners. Several of them just kind of burnt up, but most of them actually sank. Okay. Yeah. So, because they yeah. suck. <laughs> There's a reason why there was there only are... like two companies that were building them. And guys, are this boats? is going to yeah. be our last 10 minutes before open discussion. So, gotcha. if you have something juicy that you want to get out on the debate field, Now's the time to do so, and keep on sending in those super chats or questions for either debater. But right back to you guys. All right. So we've got you're you're kind of looking at the boat as being a really small thing, and I'm saying it could have been you know way bigger than that. And even by today's standards, like yeah, we don't know what it was covered. It just says covering in Hebrew, right? right? And yeah. so they could have covered it in metal. Okay, and no. think about how big those giant tankers are today. Okay, they, yes. they build boats way bigger today, and so but that's a modern technology. Like that didn't exist back then. Okay, and you're just assuming that you know the ancients were stupid cavemen. No, I'm not assuming they were stupid cavemen. I mean, they they built some pretty amazing boats, but they were wooden. But boats. But you're still under this huge impression that they were all just stupid cavemen. Okay, but they have God as their instructor here. Okay, and God can teach them how to make a better boat than today's standards. Okay, I'm thinking they could make something like we've got our big boats today that are huge, you know, oil rigs and tankers, and you know the 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 super ships today. Sure. Okay, you got okay. the huge cruise liners. And right. stuff. Those are maybe that's massive. what actually it was. It was like a big so, cruise liner. And um, and maybe you even had a jacuzzi on it, right? Because God could have just shown like Noah, like, but you'd have to make a big one because they're giants, I assume. This, so this you have to put like a big old jacuzzi about, in yeah. there. And who knows? So, maybe it had a big old buffet bar, and you know, like you could just make up anything, man. Like, okay, <laughs> you you're got just it. claiming that it's feasible because of your kind of standards, and you you're claiming that like they used feasible. steel back then when steel didn't exist. This is God we're talking about. You don't think he could teach Noah how to make steel? And you're assuming that they didn't know what steel was in those days. Why didn't they is... continue to use steel then in like boat construction after Noah like got off of the ark? Why didn't they? Is this a one-time thing? To use... Why didn't they continue to use it? There's a number of different reasons why technology can get buried and kind of disappear over time. And so, uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> It, it know, happens. Man. It happens. <sighs> technology kind of dissipates. You just, okay, right. you want to you want to say technology dissipates? You know, it's kind of like going back to the moon, right? It does. <laughs> so, sure, oh, but no, it's like, we don't have the technology that we used to have. It's we, the father we lost of all humanity. And it's a painful process to build back up again, right? And so it's and help construct by your this, own standard steel boat with a jacuzzi in it. You think that they would be able to pass that technology down to to the next generation? And you think they'd be able to pass down the moon technology, the technology that we used to get to the moon, and use that again? Right, but we lost. Yes, that we do. So what are you talking standard. about? 
yeah we oh that's we right you debated technology. whether the moon landing was real or not okay yeah. and so we um, lost that technology so it's kind of your same standard okay <laughs> if okay. we can lose that technology but we can't lose that technology that's kind of a double standard right. here so I, the, the, there's one i guess amy asked if there's a juicy thing and since like i i get that you're in the affirmative i'm sitting here grilling, grilling you i appreciate you for 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 taking a lot of my my questions because i'm grilling you and i, I know that, that, that that's what i'm doing but hey th like th that's how this kind of works right so um next time if i'm in the affirmative you can grill me but let's see i want to talk about genesis 7 4 because i did mention that it refers to every living substance was was killed right so for for seven days uh uh for yet seven days and i will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights and every living substance that i have made will i destroy from the face of the earth um, I got this from the Latter-day Saints website, which I assumed you might be a little bit more uh, comfortable with. Um, so every living substance was wiped from the face of the earth. And I just want to get you on record so that you agree, like that means that all the living substances that were on the face of the earth must have been in or on the ark, right? Yeah. That's your reading of it. So there yeah. were no like seeds floating around someplace or plant material that could have been like floating in the ocean that could have survived the flood and then grow like once like the floods subsided. And that maybe those like rafts would have had, who knows, like lizards and and, um, um, uh, you know, uh, insects and other things. Right. Like they okay. all would have to have been on the ark. Right. You're invoking Latter-day Saint doctrine. And there are times in Latter-day Saint doctrine where God took entire lands. Okay, I don't know if you've ever heard of the city of Enoch before, but the city of the city of Enoch is an entire city before the flood that was taken up into heaven. Okay, okay. the entire city was taken up into heaven. Was that the only city that was taken up into heaven before then? Okay, and so the whole thing with the city of Enoch is they were so righteous that uh, the Lord took this whole city up into heaven. Okay, and uh, after that. Like it's going to come back. That's the big thing about the city of Enoch is it was okay. taken up. It was taken back. Was that the only city that that had ever happened to? I don't know. There Wait. could have happened to other cities out there that could have been taken up into heaven that were brought back to the earth at one yeah. time. Okay, Sounds that is like a, a possibility. Of sort of story. Like you're just creating okay. like so, superhero stuff. I, I think yeah, I saw that so, movie. It wasn't that yeah. Age of Ultron when like the city was There's, pushed up into. Okay, I don't know. Listen, there are, the thing is, okay, every living substance was wiped off the face of the earth. You at least agree with that. So I suppose that maybe God somehow picked the city up and then delivered it back after. You know, that's one way you're leaving it. But you at least agree with that, right? That every happened at least substance, once. Uh, not a uh, single bacterium uh, survived, right? Not a virus. I mean, there's debate whether viruses are actually living or not. But no bacteria survived on on the face of the earth. They all would have to have been on the ark, because uh, they're living substances. Like I, I, I keep bacteria I, in my lab, really, and if I don't really take care study. of them, they die. That's for sure. Yeah, and so I'd have to kind of look, have a closer look at the Hebrew on this sp particular instance. I haven't looked at the the Hebrew on this one just yet. So uh, let, let's because get, so, okay, so there's the bacteria, right? And I guess maybe the Hebrew have some ancient Hebrews have some interesting insights into bacteria uh, perhaps. Yeah. The thing because, is because no, King hold on, James hold on, hold on. Did a so bad living substances, right? So do you think cuz right like with the flood, right? All the waters rise and God said I am killing all living substances. Do you assume fish are living substances? I do assume fish are living I would agree. Substances. What about like saying that stars and coral and sponges? Okay. It's on the face of the earth. And so I it's in the water that's not on the earth, is it? Wait, so so like I have made consider we'll destroy animals living in the, the water the as being earth. on the earth. So there's boundaries here. There are boundaries. Okay. okay? one on land versus in the water mm -hmm. and so bacteria in the water is that's not on the earth you know all these species of fish that's in the water that's not on the face of the earth okay so that means that uh whales and dolphins were not on the ark i assume they were not on the face of the earth unless they were, they were on the there crawling around on the okay. on the dirt yeah mm -hmm. all right now what about the fact that there are marine animals and there are freshwater animals. There, are, there are animals that have to live in exquisite, like sort of clean, pristine freshwater. And if they get exposed to any sort of salinity, they will die. How do you yeah. think that those animals survive? Um, you, there are times when freshwater can be like at a different layer than, uh, 
Yeah, but we're talking about a flood with it all like being pushed and and yeah, and, and even when yes. that there there yes. can be currents of fresh water that are going side by side with salt water. It doesn't instantly. Uh, right, I believe that's called yeah. an isocline when there's like a, a division between like sort of salt water and fresh water, but it's not purely fresh. That's for sure. There's definitely ions that pass from the salt water into the quote unquote fresh side, but it's just less saline, and it's not going to be suitable for freshwater fish to live in. It won't. And that's, well, presu it, it that's presuming the <laughs> that we're talking about like, you know, water that is not being mixed, uh -huh. right? They, they just kind of kind of come into slow contact with each other. And again, we're kind it's of not assuming... not what a flood is. A flood is like... Okay. And we don't know exactly what kinds of species of fish they had in those days. Again, we're kind of assuming that there were even freshwater fish on the earth in those days. And yeah. I'm not... I haven't seen anything okay. that really makes that indication. Although... Last I, two minutes. I am aware of... Gotcha. Okay. I am also aware of, uh, they've got some hot springs out here in St. George, and some people have gone and put a bunch of uh, freshwater uh, tropical fish in these hot springs, and they've been surviving for ages and ages. They just live there now. It's kind of, okay. uh, I got which is an interesting about, thing. About one having last thing hot I wanted to ask you about, that that I, I, it was on my list of questions. Um, the How did Noah feed all the animals on the ark? I including the predators, right? Because there were predators. Uh -huh. Yeah. What did yeah. he feed them? What did he feed them? I can only assume that they fed him meat. That's why he brought extra, uh, extra of the clean species so he could feed the ones, yeah, the predators. He used the clean exactly. species to feed the okay. predators. So when another huge important thing that, because you've been talking for a long time, True. is I really wanted to point out that the entire flood itself the entire flood itself, you know, flooding the entire world as we know it, okay, that is a humongous miracle, okay? And so I think it's very, very limiting to assume that no other miracles took place at that time. Sure, right? which means it's We've not got, science, that's for sure. Uh, you define science very differently than me. And so, you include yeah. room for miracles. I include room for miracles. Yeah. And so, wow. yeah, when it comes to I wish to, uh, I could publish science, on that. I really do because okay. I would have a lot more papers that way. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. That's not the standard. It's we observable. Use science, it's, it's observable. If it's observable, yeah, yeah that's kind yeah. of uh, and repeatable. And systematic. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Observable, repeatable, systematic. And those, yeah. So, and those that's are all not really what important. Is. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, again, you seem to be having your own definition of miracle here. So, I mean, it's yeah. pretty much what everyone thinks a miracle is, right? Apparently, not everyone views miracle or defines miracles the same way you do. And, okay, yeah. I suppose not. So uh, maybe uh, not everyone, miracles. apparently. All right, I suppose we could probably go to the uh, and. With yeah. that, we will start to get ready for questions. But before we do, I want to offer both of you guys the chance to tell everyone out there on the interwebs what you got going on and your final thoughts on the topic. The floor oh, you want to go first? is Fine. either one of yours. Okay, so we've been listening to Chris Thompson speak for a long time now, and uh, he has yet to give us any kind of specific answer as to how big the arc would have need to be by today's standards, okay, let alone back in those days. Standards. I understand the Bible is kind of vague about this point, and I'm okay with that. It's it's kind of vague. It's kind of relaying the concept of what took place, and that's totally fine with me. The, the question, the the big question here, is how big would the ark have needed to be in order to be feasible? And so, yeah. We can't just look, oh, well, this is a humongous miracle. And I'm sorry, that's the only miracle that we can allow at this time. Yeah, this is a, a time of great, uh, uh, yeah. If God can create one miracle and not allow that to happen, there's nothing to say that God couldn't have another miracle and also cause this to happen and help Noah actually know how to build an ark. I'm going to give you a commandment to build an ark, but I'm not going to teach you how to build a strong ark that can actually make it. Yeah, um, there's a, a scripture that's very strong. Okay, the Lord God giveth no man a commandment unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way to accomplish the thing that he hath commanded them. Okay, that is First Nephi chapter one verse five or three. I don't remember, but yeah, it's a, a really important, significant scripture. And so, yeah, if God is going to give Noah a commandment, 
he's going to prepare a way for Noah to accomplish that thing. And he's over here. Chris Thompson is talking about plumbing. He could have taught Noah about how to, to kind of uh, take care of the ark when it comes to plumbing and how to keep it clean. These kinds of things can be prepared for. And uh, it's not like <laughs> Noah never thought, Oh my goodness. You know, I, how am I going to do this? I'm sure he kind of went through moments and those kind of moments were very essential for him to go and consult with the one who gave him the commandment in the first place where he, and he can learn how to, how to deal with those kind of challenges. So, yeah. Right. Thank you so very much. And with that, Dr. Chris, the floor is yours for your closing statement. Great. So I want to thank Kyle for, yes, I, I did dominate a bit, I know, but I'm asking a bunch of questions because there's a lot of questions associated with this topic. And Amy, thank you so much for doing a fantastic job. You are awesome. So, right, the question of Noah's Ark being feasible, I think I clearly showed that it's not feasible. We're talking about this massive, massive structure that would have had to have been so enormous that obviously with like torsion and flex that it would have faced in the great flood, that it would have been leaking like a sieve. And they did, did just did not have the technology back then. Now, Kyle's sort of appealing to just filling in these gaps. He's, he's well aware of these gaps. Like he knows that there are these gaps. But now he's just kind of making things up to kind of fill in the holes, sort of like you would have to fill in the holes in the ark so that like it doesn't leak so much. And um, right, you can't do it. Like you can't just pretend that like all of a sudden God taught Noah plumbing and like the steel technology and that there was no evidence of any of that going on through the centuries up until modern day. Like there's just it's it's ludicrous to think that that's actually something that could have happened. Now, when you get to the animals, that was part of why I was talking about molecular evidence. Molecular evidence precludes any idea that these animals were from on the ark and that they were all descended from like some sort of kinds within the ark, right? It just doesn't make any sense. There's no room for all the species, certainly, that we know as them today. And even within kinds, it doesn't make any sense, whatever that term actually means. It really doesn't make any sense. Now, yeah, with the ambiguity of the Bible, talking about substances being killed, does that also include bacteria? I mean, we're just left with like, basically arguing about whether the laser on the Death Star could have destroyed Alderaan. That is essentially what this debate turns into. It's mostly a waste of time. And unfortunately, like, you know, this is something that, that some people want to teach in public schools. I'm here to say, no, we're not going to do that. And um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. I'm happy. To, so a, a little bit about me, right? So I'm a neuroscientist. I'm not, you want to check me out. I'm on... Um, you can the best place to find me for this kind of content is to go to my YouTube channel. It should be linked down below. Um, and I talk about neuroscience. I also talk about creation and evolution. I do all kinds of debates. I also have a whole bunch of information about like neuroscience and, and teaching neuroscience. I'm going to be posting some new lectures on neuroplasticity, if that's something that anyone is interested in. So thanks for having me. Thank you to both of our interlocutors, Dr. Chris and Kyle Adams, the links of which can be found in the description below. That concludes the open discussion on did Noah's Ark exist and work, but there's still fun left. We're about to move into our Q&A section where you can tag me in chat at Amy Newman or send in super chats, which will get your question priority read. There will also be an open mic after show on my channel, Amy Newman on the YouTubes. However, if you've ever thought of running your own after show, feel free to reach out to us here at modern day debate because we support all sides including yours plus we're always looking for new debaters so come on down to the ring though also don't forget to please hit like follow and subscribe it helps us reach an even larger audience and get even more fantastic debates to you our viewers with that let's get into the question and answers a big five dollar super chat from oflamo kyle when are we going to do a noah's ark case study in the ark encounter every kind of animal in the ark encounter for 90 days just to be sure i don't really follow the ark encounter model as i said i believe noah was a giant and uh so that's going to tell me that the entire Ark Encounter model is too small. 
And all right, thank you so very much for that response and that super chat. A $2 super chat from Bubblegum Gun coming in hot. Chris is too scared to debate me 1v1. Why are you running? You're right, I'm terrified. A Bubblegum Gun. Um, yeah, you know, we we chatted already, um, and it was entertaining. I don't feel like you have a whole lot to say about, like, what your model is and i think that like i'd actually be super interested in maybe hosting you and a creationist to talk about whether dogs are evolved from wolves or not i would actually be interested in that Ooh, and we're always looking for more fantastic debates and debaters and all right thank you bubble and your response and a five dollar super chat from big bad mama Kyle, how did koala bears from the Ark crawl back to Australia? Also, do you believe the animals underwent hyperspeciation post-flood? Hyperspeciation. I don't know what they mean by that. I can explain but... it. Okay. Do, um, do let, me, let me address the koala bear yeah, that's first, fine. Do that first. And then we can talk about that. Sure. So with the we understand that men scattered across the face of the earth after the flood. Did they take animals with them as they traveled across the earth? Okay. So one option is yes, the, the qual bear could have gone over there unless we have different lands that came down out of the sky uh, that were saved kind of uh city of Enix style. That's another option. Okay. Uh, but I'm kind of under the more, I like the, the, the theory of, men just taking animals with them as they uh, scatter across the land. Okay, but the problem with that, Kyle, all right, if you just kind of focus on this, is that, do you know what koalas eat? Do I know what eucalyptus leaves? Yes, the eucalyptus leaves. So like, would but they have those they eucalyptus now, leaves with them? That's what, it, that's what they eat now, but I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't even know if they had koalas in those days, really. Where did koalas come from then? That's a good question. I don't know. And just, okay. Yeah, you're the one who creation? believes. You're the one who believes in the whole evolution thing. Sure, right? right yeah, like so, if you look yeah, at the molecular data, didn't they? if you look at the molecular what? data, koalas share much more similar of their DNA to other marsupial mammals, especially those in Australia, than they do to any of the placental mammals. And so, yeah. do you claim that koalas always ate eucalyptus leaves, and that they didn't come? I mean, from at somewhere? some point, that they eventually specialized upon eucalyptus leaves, but. Like, did okay. the, the, the last common ancestors between, say, wombats and koalas eat eucalyptus leaves? No, I don't think that they they were specialized on eucalyptus leaves because wombats are, you know, they eat something different. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So, then I guess it was the, the, the common ancestor of wombats and koalas that was carried over to Australia by these people. I'm but saying who did that. It, though? It, like, we're talking about there were like four, there were four guys and their wives off the ark like how who did it well they had children after they got off the ark okay and, yeah and it would take some yeah. time for the children to grow wouldn't it it would take some time for the children to grow right like they're yes. not they're not like i'm not going to put a newborn and like put a wombat koala mix in a raft and then you know say bon voyage good luck good day the, you know good luck to get to australia right no, they, they didn't say that yeah like i said they could have as their children scattered across the face of the earth, they could have taken animals with them. And they, they, and they exclusively the brought marsupials along with them to Australia. That's one possibility. There's a lot of okay. different ways of looking at things. Gotcha. Okay, about hyperspeciation. I know we're dwelling on this one question, but the hyperspeciation, because I, I like Big Bag Mama, she always asks great questions, so I want to make sure that, that we give some uh, um, credit for that. So hyperspeciation, what she means by that, and it's kind of actually what you're getting at, is that you're suggesting that the um, on the Ark there was, must have been some sort of proto-ancestor of wombats and koalas, and that that's what was taken to Australia. And then they they speciated over the last, I don't know, what, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years into the different you know species of koalas, wombats, kangaroos, uh, you know, Tasmanian tigers, uh, the Tasmanian devil. Like, I presume they all just came from like, you know, so that's what we talk about, hyperspeciation. Do you believe that that's a possible mechanism? That occurs naturally. Are you talking so hyperspeciation in simple terms is like rapid evolution? I guess so. Yeah, like it's kind of what I referred to in my opening, 
that you would have to have hyperspeciation or ha uh, hyper evolution in order to make the 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 arc model work. Okay, well, I definitely believe that dogs have changed over time, sure. and so well, we're we're continually making new breeds of dogs. And so, mm -hmm. could they make new breeds of some other kind of animal? Like, is is the koala bear a new thing? I don't really know on that. On that, you're saying like topic. koalas were bred by people, even though they're not domesticated. Like koalas are actually really pretty nasty animals. Uh -huh. Like you don't want to be they, even though they're cute, you don't want to touch one they'll bite your face off so yeah there's good questions in, involved there that i don't really know the answer to did man end up manipulating koalas into what they are today that's a, a, a whole other question i don't I know didn't. all right we can go to the next well, one amy you can say that but it doesn't convince me Woohoo! and all right thank you for that super chat big bad mama and both of our interlocutors responses and a five dollar super chat from tim tully thank you so much for the support god save bacon not lettuces and tomato i think the majority of plant species would have become extinct okay it's not much of a question, though. I guess it's okay. more of a comment, really. Uh, yeah. I hear Norman back in my head. Tim Tully, $5. God save bacon, not lettuces and tomato. I think the majority of plant species would have become extinct. Yeah, what he's saying is like, you know, the Bible talks about how all the animals were on the ark and different pairs. But it doesn't really say a whole lot about plants. But obviously, like, and that's because the ancients just thought that, like, plants just kind of emerged out of the ground. They didn't do a lot of thinking about plants. They would have thought, well, okay, the waters would have receded, and then all of the plants would have just sprung forth from the ground. But we know that plants would not be able to tolerate the pressure of the, of, of the flood. And, you know, you would have to keep those plants on board. Keep them as seeds? I don't know. Maybe, I, but not all plants, uh, you know, like operate just from seed per se, like some bud off and, and they require like some very pristine, complex uh, interactions with like, um, uh, you know, um, uh, pollinators, right? For instance, like there'd have to be certain kinds of insects that are needed in order to pollinate those plants or even bats. They're, they're plants that depend upon bats to do pollination. So like it's a highly intricate web that we find within life and that includes the plants. And right, it does not make sense for it to be on the ark. I'm sorry, I'm stealing your question, Kyle, but there you go. Well, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm looking for it right now because I do recall them mentioning something about seeds and him going out and collecting seeds for different plants. Uh, and so I don't really see the issue, but you, you can say it doesn't make sense to you, but yeah, for him to go out and collect seeds, it, I have no problem with that. And we're about to get our last super chat. We still have some questions in, but if you're going to want your chat question, your burning desire that you wanted to ask either of our interlocutors, send in those super chats and it will be sent right to the front of the line. But I killed Earl sending in their four month membership chat. Kyle, please give a solution to the heat problem. Dr. Chris, you may need to explain it to him. BTW, the pitch argument was brilliant. The pitch was never there in the Hebrew. So you're just assuming that there was pitch, but it just says a covering. Cover it from on the inside and cover it on the outside. It could have been metal for all I know. And so, yeah, just assuming that it was pitch is exactly that. It's just an yeah. assumption. Okay, and so, so you can you can assume that there were problems with it, but as I understand it, and I already explained this whole thing, that God's not going to give a commandment that He's not going to provide a way to handle it, and so if it means kind of teaching Noah about some concepts of plumbing and even air conditioning, for all I know, yeah, that it's a feasible thing for me. That's kind of the the, the amazing thing about miracles is miracles are a feasible thing. Miracles even happen today, and so yeah, in our okay, days, so. I, Kyle, are you familiar with the heat problem? Am I familiar with the heat problem? Yes. Uh, I'm just familiar with your saying that miracles can't happen. Okay? No, and no, so, that's not the heat or problem. Or miracles can happen, but with problems involved in those miracles. Well, 
No, that's not exactly what the heat problem is. I'm happy to explain this. Um, I'll try to give a succinct explanation. So generally, creationists believe that the entirety of the geological column post the uh, Proterozoic, so from around 600 million years ago on, that's where we find animals, um, that's the Phanerozoic. All of that must have been laid down during Noah's flood. So they explain the origin of the uh, geological column during that time. Now, the, the, the thing is, we can look through the geological column and see all kinds of things that would have would have generated an enormous amount of heat if all of that uh, uh, activity was compressed into a single year. So, for instance, just limestone alone will generate an enormous amount of heat energy if you're going to require, like, basically miles of limestone to be generated within a single year now of course it can't actually happen in a flood because you know limestone actually requires sort of certain very specific water um uh, conditions in order for it to form but if you if you're going to require it to all happen within a single year just limestone alone is going to generate so much heat that it would actually boil the ocean and it's basically like the energy of like several nuclear bombs per kilometer on the surface of the earth that's just from limestone now when you go through and you look at like say impact craters because they also say that impact craters like meteors like also must have hit the surface of the earth during that time same thing you know we're talking about dozens and dozens of nuclear bombs that would have been set off across the earth there's all kinds of sources radioactivity another thing compressed all into a single year must have boiled the oceans that's the heat problem i didn't bring it up because like i know we were kind of focused on the arc per se but it's obviously a big issue uh it what sounds are your thoughts to me about like it? you're just inserting a, a problem with Here's a miracle. This is happening. No, 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 no. It's it not just... a miracle. Like they pretend that like all this is like nat like this just would have occurred. Right. Obviously, they, they know that God like made all the rain happen and flooded the earth. But then we have to have some sort of explanation for like, why is there the geological column? And of course, most creationists say that, well, that must have happened during the flood. But when we look at the geological column, in order for all that to have occurred within a single year, it would have required so much heat that it would have boiled off the oceans many times over. All right, I'm that's the heat problem telling you that there's a miracle that took place there okay. and yeah that's, so that's a miracle that that's how you solve the heat problem okay fair enough that's miracles happen okay even in today's standards like i said and so it's been kind of a really fascinating thing kind of looking into modern day miracles that that can't happen even in our own lives and all right, thank you guys. Apologize for the keyboard ASMR there for a second, but I want to thank both of our interlocutors for those answers and to I Killed Earl for their membership, along with all of the fantastic members and people in chat there. We're heading on to chat questions, which there's just a few of, and so if you want to get your desired question out there, it's been Hold it up and hear your favorite two interlocutors. Now is the time to do so. They have been so great. The Kentucky Atheist question for Kyle. How do you discount the fact that there is zero evidence for your claims? What branch of science do you think proves any aspect of your fable? Okay, that's a loaded question. So I'm just going to ignore it. There's not zero evidence for for the flood. He's just assuming that there is zero evidence, and he's asserting that there is zero evidence in the question. So I don't claim there is zero evidence for the flood. I yeah, I see a lot of evidence for the flood, and so uh, yeah, I live out here in the desert. I live pretty close to Zion National Park, and I look at all the plateaus, uh, and I've even heard of fossils up there on top of. Uh, Mount Everest over there. And so. Uh-oh. Oh, okay. Looks like he's frozen. I apologize for that, guys. I know there are storms heading all over. And so hopefully Kyle will join us back in a second. Let me look if there are any other questions. That's or Kyle, do, do, do. Or for me. Yes. Well, I, what I, what I meant is I'm looking for questions for you and I said, oh, I see. Okay. For Kyle. Right. No, all good. Those are for Kyle. Um, yeah. Do, do, do. How did animals live exclusively on the east? This is for Kyle. And that's where did all the water go? 
Well, we have a few. I, I may just read out the questions for Kyle, and you might want to take a kicker at him because that may mm -hmm. end up be the wrapping of the night while you're doing that. Don't mind the video, ladies and gentlemen. I'll adjust that. But if you would like to take a crack at it, the Kentucky Atheist asks for Kyle, how did civilizations like the Egyptians and Chinese continue right on through this flood without noticing or having any record whatsoever? They kept detailed records, but no flood. And I'll also say, if you have a question for Dr. Chris, now is definitely the time mm -hmm. to send them in. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. That's one thing I didn't bring up because I was trying to focus kind of on the ark. But we have contemporaneous civilizations at that time who had no evidence of this global flood, right? There's no discussion of it whatsoever. The The ancient pyramids, like the earliest ancient pyramids, actually predate when, like many creationists say, when the flood occurred. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. Sorry and about that. My internet died. <laughs> no, you're all good. It looks like you're back. Great. There was a great question in here um, from, what, Kentucky Atheist, I think it was? Yes. So yeah. the question was, Kyle, how did civilization like the Egyptians and Chinese continue right on through this flood without noticing or having any record whatsoever? They kept detailed records, but no flood. Um, okay, you're sit you're kind of that's a, another loaded question that there was no flood in there. And so uh as I understand it, the civilizations departed or kind of broke up after the flood happened. And so there was no Chinese back in the days of the flood. And so, of course, they're not going to keep a record of the flood when their civilization began after the flood happened. So that's the thing, though. Like, um, I mean, I guess you're trying to time the flood to be before when we know, like, there was a, a an origination of the of like the Chinese civilization, and my understanding is like the Chinese civilization, like the 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 um, the you know like basically goes back nearly five thousand years ago. Like the archaeological evidence goes even like maybe even longer than that. Like we have good evidence that they would have been there long before than when like the genealogy that's described in the Bible could possibly occur when you got like go from Noah to like King David. Like it doesn't make any uh, you're, sense. You're still looking at that's because you're still looking at it on with presentism okay. involved. And so I already told you about the calendars thing and about how you a did. calendar in Alaska is going to be different than a calendar in and on the I got I know people from Alaska. They use the same calendar. That's because we it's not the same. You're not you're going by a Hebrew calendar. Okay. okay? Right. And the way days are judged in Hebrew is different than the way days are judged according to the Gregorian calendar. So, yeah, when you judge a day, yeah, things can get really thrown off. Okay. Yeah, by considerable amounts. And all right, thank you for that question and the answer both interlocutors. But question from MXD, how did animals that live exclusively on other continents made it to the Middle East? How did they make it to the Middle East? Um, um, okay, so there's the big question right there is, did Pangea exist? There were there have been many earthquakes in time. There's uh, your model accepts continental drift, does it not? Sure. And so I understand your model kind of puts continental drift as something that takes place over a really long time. Okay, and I and right. I I get that. And uh, yeah, and so with me, I I kind of wonder like, did that happen like before the flood? Did it happen after the flood? There's a lot of questions involved. Uh, that I don't really know the answer to. And so one thing I already brought up before was that people could have taken animals with them. So if people are traveling across oceans uh, post-flood, they could have taken animals with them post-flood. Okay, that's Kyle. How so one issue with your hypercontinental drift is that that also generates heat. So this is also a part of the heat problem I didn't mention. But if you're going to imagine that like the continents would be like super speeding across the ocean to go from Pangaea to like where their current location is today within a year or a couple of years, 
it would create so much heat that it would be like literally like thousands and thousands of nuclear weapons being released all at the same time, like within square kilometers across the uh, the entirety of the world. That's how much heat it would generate. Just that one thing alone. Okay. But I suppose a miracle was also involved. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> we, in the scriptures, I've, I've read about people who could command mountains to, to move and they would be moved. And okay. we look at, we look at, you know, commanding the sun to stop in the sky True. and it stops, right? And Gandalf did some pretty amazing things in the Lord of the Rings. So, yeah, yeah. you kind of want to discount it just because, yeah, it's I mean, a miracle. And that's, that true too? that's wrong. Right. Yeah. Okay. You want to, you want to discount it because it was a miracle and that's, that's wrong to, to do that because miracles happen. Okay. And all right. Unless someone sends in more super chats or questions, these are going to be our final two. Though one looks like it was a rehashing. I think we answered the similarly. The Kentucky atheist again asked Kyle, "How do you solve the heat problem?" The K we see points to Earth billions of years old. If it is only six thousand, this decay would have caused enough heat to vaporize the Earth. Okay, so you're kind of inserting that there was a heat problem. Do you claim that science proves anything? Are you talking to me? Yeah. I mean, Do you claim that science proves anything? The, the weight of evidence consistent with models allows for predictions that we can test and repeat uh, those tests. And, you know, so we can predict, like, how nature works. So Is you don't ever, even like, know proven, if there was like, a heat Proofs Problem. exist in, you know, I, like mathematics and I suppose like in law, I guess. But in science, we don't prove anything. It's the weight of okay. the evidence that supports it. So you think there might have been a heat problem. You don't think there was a heat problem. No, we can look at the way geology is, works that's today. That's a definitive statement. Yes. You can't right. We know how geology works today. Proof. And if we're going to assume, like, say, for instance. I've been letting you talk for a long time. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Okay. I thought that that was a question. All right, I'm stating that you can't make definitive statements if you don't believe you that you have any proof for these definitive statements. All of your definitive statements should be mites. And if every single definitive statement is now void because you have no proof of anything, okay, then I don't even know what you're doing in the debate in the first place because you can't really do a debate just based on maybe mites could have. Uh, that's not true. And that's not the way science works at all. It doesn't work on mites. It works in the preponderance of evidence and probability. Okay, but you're still and we can have a like really, really statements. high probability that it works a certain way. Okay. And it's not about mites. Like it has to be this way with a you know near certainty. We can never say a hundred percent certain, but with near certainty that if the continents were rapidly tra you know racing across the ocean and then like the continents were being split within a couple of years or within a year, um, that, that would generate so much heat. It would have to, because oh, of the nature. To. Yes, even though you don't because of the nature of the way proven. physics works, like the way chemistry works, like like you you basically are just saying like we like the way we look at the world now and what the way we can test things now in local experiments and understand always it is like this whenever we test it and that's generally the case like it's going to be that way that what that means is that if you apply at that scale it has to generate that level amount of heat it just does it has this to is the heat problem that's, yes that's that's a, unless that's you invoke statement. a miracle which is that like is, basically okay. Kyle, I, I, you may not know about You're this. contradicting yourself you to look at guts at gibbons um uh videos on the heat problem because she she does a really great job talking about the heat problem and basically the creationists have kind of thrown in the towel and they've done what you do which is like Yep, you're right. It's a miracle. We cannot explain it by physical, natural mechanisms. We're going to have to just invoke a miracle. And they don't want to do that because really the goal is to like try to get evolution out of public schools and, or, or to try to get creationism taught in public schools. But if you're going to call like it a miracle, well, then it doesn't make any sense. It's not science. They know that. It's, I, I appreciate your um, your candor here. I really do. Like Because a lot of creationists are loath to use the miracle word, the M word. But you do, which is great. So I think that I saw another super chat going, Amy. Yeah, you're, indeed, you're just contradicting indeed. yourself. <laughs> say this has to be the case is a definitive statement. Okay, what you mean to say if if science never proves anything or if you have no proof, then you should be saying this might be the case. That is the intellectually honest thing to do. But if you have no proof, then you're just being dishonest with yourself. And thank you for that question and our sponsor, both interlocutors. Did indeed a super chat come in, plus one or two more questions. 
so excited with all the enthusiasm out there. $5 super chat from Al. Thank you for the support. Regardless of how long daylight is per day, does Kyle believe that the frequency the days occur varies across the Earth? The frequency days occur vary through across the Earth. And so, uh, again, it's defining day is it the period of time that you see the sun in the sky and so if the we see the sun in the sky for uh 24 hours and uh in alaska or you know the north pole then yes the, that's going to be a much longer day uh in the north pole than it would be someplace like antarctica where they don't see the sun for 24 hours Thank you so very much for that super chat, Al. We're going to move into just a few more regular questions. From I Killed Earl, how did Noah get all the seeds to grow super fast to feed all those animals? I, I'm not, I'm not the one who was there. So if if he had uh, ways of actually tending to plants on the ark because again we don't know how big it was it could have been really big depending on noah's size and so if he actually kind of had a greenhouse within the ark i don't see that as an impossibility and so he could have had seed starters in the ark that he ended up taking outside of the ark so there's so much realm of possibility here to say that it is impossible is kind of absurd to me and so notice that my opponent here has not once said how big the ark would have needed to be in order to be feasible. Not once has he said that. He just says it's it's just not feasible. It's it's impossible. That's that's all he's got. If it's bigger than three hundred fifty feet, uh, feet long, yes, it's infeasible. Okay, you're welcome to say that. <laughs> okay, but that's again a definitive statement. Okay, sure. which you've already said. Based there on our experience with the six mass schooners, right? Yeah. Using technology from just a hundred years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So you've already invalidated every single definitive statement you could possibly make by saying science never proves anything. So, yeah, you can't say it's impossible or infeasible if, yeah, because that's a definitive statement. So I don't even know I'm debating you. Getting spicy. Enjoy the back and forth. Thank you for the question and the responses. Another from the Kentucky Atheist coming in hot, Dr. Chris. Is it even possible for a family of eight to result in the genetic diversity we see among humans today? Wouldn't it take no less than 500 people to survive the environmental pressures? I think less than 500 people to survive the environmental pressures. Uh, wait, but no and less I, than 500 people? I say coming in hot, but I think this is actually now a thing for you. Dr. Yes, Chris. Right, you're yes. kind of setting up a... Uh... Uh, the cans for me to shoot down. Yeah. So um, I appreciate that. Yes. So th there's a lot of problems with the idea of genetic diversity with animals coming in pairs and then humans, you know, only like three pairs basically, right? Because Noah and his wife, they had three sons and they married these three random girls, right? That were on the ark. So all of humanity is descended from these three guys that came off the ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. No, there's not enough time from the ark uh, in order to explain the current genetic diversity that we see amongst human beings. When you look at the genetic diversity just within Africa alone, it is vast. And the reason why genetic diversity is so vast within Africa is because that's where humanity evolved. Humanity was in, um, Homo sapiens was within Africa for a very long time. And therefore that would allow for enough time for genetic variants to come about that, you know, we use the same techniques in order for me to, you know, for me to say that like my ancestors are from say Germany and England, which I've done the genetic testing. I know that that's the case. Um, we can do the same thing for, on bigger and broader scales. And within Africa, it's way too much genetic diversity to be explained by these three guys coming off the ark. Animals, it's the same thing. It's the same problem with animals. And the problem with animals is that if you have just two pair, you have a, a pair of animals, a male and a female, now you have inbreeding depression. What are the children of those animals going to breed with? They're brothers and sisters, right? Inbreeding depression is a real serious issue. And we know when populations get less than like, say, 500 and especially like 50 individuals, they start to experience inbreeding depression. This is actually something that's facing um, the uh, the um, 
the mountain lions in, in uh, Southern California, because they're so isolated, we have inbreeding depression occurring in those populations. And we're talking about individuals that are a lot more than just two. So it doesn't make any sense at all. How many definitive statements was that? <laughs> I kind of lost count. I'm sorry. Okay. We've got the weight of all the evidence that supports this. If you want to argue that like inbreeding depression is not a thing, I'm happy to have that debate. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but there's no point in debating when you don't when you are making definitive statements that you You can make definitive statements yourself. if you have the weight of evidence in favor of it. Then then it's not really you're still kind of saying it might be could possibly be, but it's not. The I'm same still as open it. to the interpretation that inbreeding depression is not a thing, but the weight of the evidence shows that when populations of animals or human beings get so small that you have, you know, uh, brothers and sisters and cousins making babies, that you get all kinds of genetic problems that occur. And we see that over and standards. over and over again, Kyle. And in this is exactly what would have happened for those animals as they came off. That's the another presentism. And, and okay, and so I, apparently genetics here. works very differently four thousand four hundred years ago too. So All right. yeah, well, we kind of look at more pure blood back in those days. Okay, pure blood, more pure blood, a lot less defects, uh, a lot less in, defects. in our blood in those days. Yeah, you're still so, talking about inbreeding depression, though. In breeding depression yes, is kind of because the, in, the, the individuals, like the, the brothers and sisters, still have to mate with each other, right? Yes. Yes. Right. So we're talking yeah. about incest for every single animal that came off the ark, except for the clean ones, right? Because there were enough of them, except for the ones that Noah burned well, because he, kind you know, of, God you're... demanded that they had to be sacrificed. Okay. I presented multiple possibilities, okay. right? And one of them was a city of Enoch kind of possibility. And so. Yeah, what? you're kind of ignoring that. Oh, yes. Yeah, so the I, city I, floating but, in the sky, right? You're going to go to the floating city. That was one scriptural reference that I, okay. I brought up. In one instance. And that wasn't of, mentioned in Genesis 6 place. or 7, that like a whole city was uh, brought up into the sky. It, that, that didn't take place during the flood. That took place before the flood. Enoch lived yeah, uh, the, before Noah did. Okay. And so and like the, the city just stayed up in there, up there until after the flood or what? Yeah. And so all the people, okay. And so then after the flood, then the city came back to earth. Yeah. What evidence do you have that this actually occurred? What, well, you just tell me that uh, this whole thing, that the, we've got all this genetic speciation, right? And you're, you're the one kind of pointing out this huge evidence saying that there had to be something, otherwise we'd have all these different problems, right? And so the, you're already kind of asserting that there is evidence for it. Otherwise, according to you, these things just wouldn't, yeah, it doesn't make sense without it. It doesn't sound so, like evidence that there was a floating city above the flood and that was descended down onto earth. So that basically you're kind of, you, you, I think what the problem is you're seeing that, that there is a big problem with your, with, with the way the story is written in Genesis six and Genesis seven. I pointed out all these holes. And basically what you're doing is you're creating a whole new arc, the floating city, above the earth i didn't create anything that that's what the scripture talking about it doesn't talk about that city. okay this is the city of enoch okay and yes. the city of enoch that is that's a scripture thing for me that's part of our doctrine but how many okay. people were were hiding in this city ark and all the animals and things that were up there i don't know how, how okay. big the city of enoch was all right sounds good man and i will say we have five more minutes left. We don't want to respect our Analocanist time. However, it's been a great debate, a fantastic Q and A. Want to thank everyone in chat. A five dollar super chat from I Killed Earl. We have proof for the heat problem, Kyle. Look at Hawaii, and that's super slow. Now multiply that by umpteenth degree. Miracles are a BS excuse. I'm glad you agree that science is capable of proving things. Okay. Okay. Thank you so very much. I killed an Earl for your super chat and the support and both of our interlocutors. We only have one or two more and then we are heading out a question. Well, here's two that kind of go together. We had uh, Mr. Snoo wants to know, Kyle, Noah believes in flat earth? Noah believes in flat earth. Yes, that's my overall impression that 
Noah believes in flat Earth. And then the kind of a follow up, but in a different direction from someone from Surgeon General. What is up for Kyle? Since you believe the Earth is flat and covered with a dome, where did all this water come from for this flood? Uh, there were flood gates, and so I can assume that it went out the flood gates. Okay. And it, that's all I can say. I know there were springs of water that were broken up. It says the earth was broken up during the flood. And uh, so it, did it go back kind of the same way it came in? I, I'm not entirely sure of all of the mechanics behind it. Uh, and if there's other ways to the lands outside of <laughs> of the firmament, uh, I don't know how all that works and exactly where there are. There are talk. There is talk about the Antarctic passage. Did the flood go out that way? That's possible. I don't know. It's kind of a, a vague understanding of things, but that is what it is. I'm not touching that with a 10 foot pole. And all right, this is our last question. It is going to be for either interlocutor. I think one may have more to say, but who knows which one? And so with that, where did all the water go? And this will be the last question of the night. We Whoever would just like to answered go. that. No, no. Like once all the water was on the earth, where did it all go? Did you answer that? We you just talked about gates? kind of how did it get out, and so I, I, I mentioned floodgates, and right. that's how they yeah. came in through the gates, whatever that. Yeah, is. but it where are these gates? Gone? Well, I think oh, the original gates. question was. I did mention the Antarctic Passage. So the last question or two was where, where did all the water come from? And I would say this is kind of like a post question. This is right. where did all the water yeah. go? Yeah, it's a different question. Yeah, there were floodgates where, where water came in from the. It came from uh, above, but it also came from below. And so the one theory I've heard is that the earth was dunked into the water and brought back up because that's how baptism is done. Okay, when 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 you when someone is baptized, they don't just pour the water onto you at least mm, catholics do that but that's not that's not a full immersion okay the earth was immersed and so some people claim that the earth was dumped and that's just one possible uh claim out there and so there was one extra super chat that came in on the finish line a five dollar super chat from forte in order to protect people, should teaching magical thinking be regulated? It seems rather cruel to teach kids that invisible magicians exist. I kind of point to NASA with that and talk about the the magicians. And I have a huge problem with major textbooks today that make a lot of claims. The sun is 93 million miles away and you should believe it because I said so. Uh, that's a, a huge problem with it. And so I really enjoy having evidences and kind of uh, making claims founded on evidences. Um, here's my speculation. And this is these are different think reasons why you should believe my speculation. That is the way textbooks should be taught, not just this is so because my teacher said so or because this guy said so. And so that's my whole understanding of it. And I, so, yeah. Yeah, and I hope right. you would agree with me on that. I mean, textbooks aren't taught or aren't written that way because, like, I have a series called Modern Earth Science Destroyed mm -hmm. that gives instance after instance after instance of this exact thing happening. That, like, textbooks are filled with just things that teachers want to just say, this is just the way it is. Because that's yes. not how textbooks are written. Like, textbooks are I've written by guys like me otherwise. Who, have, who are expert in the field who can write about these topics with our understanding of the evidence and, and, and trying to portray to students in as clear a way as possible of what our understanding of the evidence is. Like that's the way textbooks are written. That's not what my proof shows. And you've got to see my okay, I've been involved series, in modern writing Earth science textbooks. destroyed. Okay. Modern earth science destroyed. Okay. It's, it's a, a series just kind of reading a typical high school science textbook and pointing out all of these different, I call them tiger traps. Okay. Where you make a claim, but it has nothing to support that, that claim. It just says, this is so because we said so. Well, sure. In a textbook, you can't necessarily lay out all the evidence um, for say every single claim because it would like take too much time. Like there's some things that just kind of have to be sort of um, uh, 
um, you know, uh, that are that are so basic that it would be kind of silly to just lay out all the evidence. But it doesn't mean that there's not evidence for it. Um, you know, like when I am illustrating something about my science, I can always illustrate like this is the evidence. This is the experiments we've done. But then I draw a conclusion about what that is. And then in a textbook, you might just be just laying out, well, this is what the conclusion is. Okay. But we this have textbooks textbook... written by experts. Like they're not going to lay out like the data per se showing, for instance, that say Saturn exists and that it's a certain distance away from from the sun. Like, you know, like we have data that shows that. Uh, I'm but we glad that you can provide references for your claims. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you can provide references for your claims. Okay, sure. these texts, th this textbook that I'm pointing out has zero references for their claims. Okay, okay? zero, uh -huh. and that's problematic, hugely problematic, especially in our day and age. So, yeah. Okay. And all right, I want to thank both of our interlocutors. Corey Clark sent in a five dollar. No question, it would just feel weird not to pay for this level of entertainment right at the end. And we just want to thank you right back to all of our super chatters, all of our chatters. In fact, I want to thank our interlocutors, Dr. Chris and Kyle Adams, the people in chat, our fantastic mods out there, and most importantly, you, our audience for joining us here tonight on Modern Day Debate. We're a neutral platform. Welcome everybody from all walks of life. If you're looking for even more fantastic debates, we are all over the internet, including your favorite podcasting platform like Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And if you enjoy debates or the show, then please don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe. It helps us get an even wider audience. There will also be an after mic, after show, open mic on my channel, Amy Newman, on the YouTubes. However, if you've ever thought of running your own after show, feel free to reach out to us here at Modern Day Debate because we support all sides, including yours, Plus, we're looking for new debaters, so come on down to the ring. Plus, if you love listening to debates, including tonight's debate on Did Noah's Ark Exist and Work with our fantastic debaters, Dr. Chris and Kyle Adams, who are here to help us find out that answer. If you would like to know what any of the guests have said tonight, all of their links are in the description below. Finally, if you're looking for more back and forth, 24-7, 365, feel free to check out our MDD Discord, which often throws after parties along with more online fun. And with that, I am Amy Newman with Modern Day Debate. We hope you continue having great conversations, discussions, and debates. Good night, everyone. Good night. Peace. Peace.